Hi, my name is Miles Ward. I'm a solutions architect with Amazon Web Services, and I'm currently preventing you from imbibing beer. And as a result, I will try to do this as quickly as possible. Uh, this is a talk uh, about MongoDB, uh, about running MongoDB on the cloud, and not just running it. We're trying to rock it on the cloud. Uh, we want to build uh, an infrastructure that takes advantage of all of the sophistication and all of the capability that MongoDB offers uh, and couple that with the scalability and cost efficiency and high performance available on AWS. Uh, today's talk um, hopefully will be uh, a good overview of what's possible. Um, we'll, I'm hoping to dispel a couple of myths um, and introduce a couple of folks that uh, have helped a lot in uh, making it so that Mongo runs as well as it does in the AWS environment. So there are three basic things that we're trying to uh, help people understand about um, performance and uh, capacity for MongoDB on AWS. First, MongoDB is very simple to use, very simple to deploy, very simple to manage. We'll talk about some structures for that, some ways, we've, ways that AWS has made it easier. It's also very stable. It's a, an environment now um, you know, that, that has a lot of capacity to deliver high performance for production workloads, for mission critical workloads. Uh, I'll give a couple examples of that. It's also something that's very scalable. It's very much designed uh, in, this, in, in line with the best practices of Amazon Web Services to be able to horizontally scale and accommodate the workloads uh, that, uh, that will help your business grow. So um, uh, we've, we've done a lot to make it so that this is something that's referenceable by you. I, I'm the author of a white paper on MongoDB, um, which is now critically outdated. So please, don't read this document. It's now inaccurate. Um, uh, in the uh, nearly a year since it's been published, uh, not only has 10Gen released uh, several new additions to the software, but we've released mm, something like six new instance types and a dozen new products. So it's really critical that the one, the information that I'll share over the next bit, uh, and our soon to be coming update to this paper uh, be a better source of guidance for you about the right way uh, to build on AWS. So if you've never used Mongo before, this is maybe a good place to start to sort of observe the overview, but if you're in the middle of doing the next production deployment of, uh, of, ten, of MongoDB, one, I certainly recommend you reach out to the 10 Gen folks, and two, uh, interact with your solution architect at AWS uh, and capture the newest best practices. So um, we've also made it super easy to deploy uh, by partnering with 10 Gen to deploy MongoDB through the AWS marketplace. How many folks have seen the marketplace? Yes, awesome. So. Uh, marketplace, imagine that is a, an Amazon.com business trying to allow you to consume goods and services on the internet. Uh, marketplace uh, makes it super, super easy uh, to deploy a, a MongoDB server on demand, uh, makes it simple to launch that server, even creates a single node uh, with the right kind of basic disk configuration to take advantage of the performance of EBS. But you'll note, I said a word that maybe should be uncomfortable for you. I used the word single node. Yes, single node, single node. So uh, for most folks that are building production deployments of MongoDB, you'll recognize that Mongo was natively designed to operate in the context of replication. It has very, very sophisticated systems for replicating across multiple nodes in order to de deliver high availability and scalability. So it's really critical from our perspective that the test systems that exist available by Marketplace, the tools for evaluating single nodes uh, be the first step in your production design for an architecture system, which should really be multiple nodes, a horizontally distributed set uh, of MongoDB servers on EC2, um, both by replication as well as sharding of the data set. We'll talk about some mechanics for that. So uh, as a part of the white paper, we describe um, you know, a, a basic architecture for high-scale MongoDB installations on EC2. Um, this is a, just a quick clip from that white paper. Um, in general, what you're looking to do uh, is to not only replicate but shard, uh, to shard uh, in, in a way that you've um, made it so that the queries that you're running in your data set um, have servers to address for uh, the correct sets of data. And you really want to supply uh, the right kind of storage infrastructure to meet the performance needs of any of the data set that you have that falls out of memory. So as most of you are probably familiar, uh, MongoDB uses memory map storage as its model, and as a result, the in, in best practice mode is 
to be in memory at all times, if at all possible. We've added a relatively significant uh, addition to our fleet. Uh, just today, how many folks saw that CR1 240 gig of memory instance? That changes the state of the art in, from our perspective in terms of MongoDB. Um, and so we're eager to start testing, frankly, uh, on that instance type uh, on top of AWS. But um, up and before that, we have a whole fleet of instances, uh, many, many successful customers distributed across all the different instance types on AWS, high memory, uh, certainly 64-bit instances uh, on top of us. And, and an important part of the design that we chose here, this sort of layout, uh, is it's not one that you have to deploy on your own. We've built, uh, using the programming language uh, that AWS put together, CloudFormation, uh, a template that allows you to deploy this architecture uh, at the click of a button. So how many folks have used CloudFormation before? Awesome. So uh, yeah, if you're interested, go in um, and create a CloudFormation stack uh, of a web scale, high scale, high performance MongoDB setup. It will probably cost you lunch if you run it for about an hour. Um, uh, and this is available not only from Mongo and from Tension. Go ahead. It's true. So uh, CloudFormation is built by an awesome uh, team, and that team has an eye in it. Uh, and, and as a result, there's, uh, there's a lot of work that needs to be done uh, to have it keep pace with the rapid scale of innovation. So uh, you can certainly build 1,000 IOPS in your provisioned IOPS volumes, which is what we had out a couple of months ago. Uh, and that's a good place for, I would say, 80% of the MongoDB installations in production globally. Uh, across this many instances. Now, if you are looking for higher ratio, higher performance storage subsets, you will have to do this deployment direct. You can use Puppet and Chef and other kinds of scripting languages, or you can just go through and click that stuff out on your own. But um, uh, that is a limitation for CloudFormation. You're absolutely right. Uh, one other step, one other component uh, that we've tried to do is uh, show you uh, the stability benefits of running uh, MongoDB on top of AWS. So. Um, we really hope, we really recommend very strongly, as does TenGen, that uh, this data stay in memory. That's the way Mongo was designed. Mongo was designed uh, to have your uh, system data live in RAM. Uh, these are the RAM counts for uh, each of the different uh, instance types up until uh, this morning when they changed them on us, and so now this is incomplete. Um, uh, but on top of the memory that you use, you do have to design for storage. So we have three basic storage subsystems. Uh, and each of them are useful uh, and, and important in your designs for MongoDB. So the first, certainly, as, uh, as uh, Jared pointed out, uh, provisioned IOPS volumes provide an entirely different experience from an EBS standpoint for consistent, high-performance IO delivery. Uh, 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 MongoDB is a system that, um, that, when out of memory, consumes IOPS at a, at a very significant rate. It has a lot of workloads. Uh, our workload components that drive, uh, drive traffic to disk. And so uh, if EBS standard volumes have been a bottleneck in your application designs, uh, provisioned IOPS can deliver significantly higher performance today, up to 2,000 IOPS per volume, uh, and those can be aggregated across uh, multiple volumes to your instances using MD-ADM RAID in combination with LVM uh, to hold uh, not only the primary data but the uh, op log and, as well. We also, for the highest scale installations, I uh, have another instance type, the uh, high one 4x large. So these instances have uh, two one terabyte SSD-based ephemeral volumes. So those instances, super, super high performance. We'll show what, uh, what that looks like here in a second. Um, but also uh, important to note that that storage is ephemeral. So if an instance stops, not terminates or is lost, but stops, that data is wiped and permanently lost. So it's really important that you control access to the stop command on those. I really recommend using identity and access management to create users that do not have the ability to stop these instances as a way, one way of protecting uh, accidental termination or accidental failure of machines. Uh, another component there would be certainly to uh, take advantage of the replication that's present. Uh, and another pattern we've seen uh, is having um, the SSD-based nodes uh, as being, uh, you know, an odd number the, as required for uh, uh, the, uh, the replication that gets done but also had to have a low priority member of the replica set that is based on EBS so that the data can be snapshotted. So we're gonna add that pattern as a critically important component of the update to the white paper. Uh, for provisioned IOPS 
to do what it's supposed to do, uh, it's really important that you use EBS optimized instances. So there are not only additional bandwidth available, uh, 500 megabits a second, uh, dedicated bandwidth to EBS on our M1 large instances, and a gigabit a second of network bandwidth on our M1 X large and uh, M2 4 X large instances. Um, that network connectivity is also designed uh, for a more direct path at a lower jitter rate to disk. And as a result, um, EBS provisioned IOPS's uh, commitments around uh, variability reduction uh, apply when you have optimized instances turned on. So critical that those instance types be the one that you use in your production MongoDB setup. So um, from a, uh, to measure that sort of performance, uh, standard EBS uh, with a single volume, one of the behaviors of standard EBS that's different than provisioned IOPS EBS uh, is that it has a write cache that sits in front of the disk. That write cache provides significant write performance benefits to standard EBS volumes for the short term. So as your Mongo instance writes to local or to non-local to EBS disk, uh, early short-term tests, short duration evaluations will find these giant blooms of performance, thousands of IOPS as we stream effectively into cache memory that's local on the EBS fleet. That's not how it works in the long term. If you look at the original design for EBS, the intention was to support the boot of EC2 instances and the swap files that they use. And that model uh, works best uh, when there's a little bit of cache memory available. Provisioned IOPS as a consistent performance delivery system doesn't support the same kind of bursting workload, which in a lot of ways, the, uh, the way that 10Gen takes advantage of disk uh, would benefit from. So there's, there's a trade-off there. Your early demonstrations, your little tests uh, may show significant mountains of performance. All of a sudden, EBS will do these magical things and show you thousands and thousands of IOPS. We have lots of tests in MongoPerf where EBS looks like a, you know, a complete Hail Mary. But uh, an hour in or two hours in or a week in or three weeks in, um, you'll start to see the variability ramp up and the consistency that provisioned IOPS can deliver uh, where it does exactly the same thing every single millisecond uh, is really an important benefit. So. Um, the other component there is you can aggregate to significantly higher performance using provisioned IOPS. So uh, that ends up looking a little like this, and it's a little hard to read because it's supposed to have a build, but let me see if I can make it smaller because that's kind of impossible. So that's a little better. So this is a standard EBS volume on the left uh, running, Mon running Mongo Perf for random 4K reads. Um, you're looking at you know, hundreds as the steady state, low single digit hundreds, uh, and then blips down to 76, and, and you know, a relatively high degree of variability here. Um, this is a single 1,000 IOPS, provisioned IOPS volume, and you'll note the variability is down here in the single digit, right? They're talking 99.9% .9 there in terms of consistency, and this runs for hours at this state. This is the SSD-based hosts running to uh, in a, uh, a, a mirrored configuration for durability. So you're talking 65,000 something IOPS uh, from a database performance perspective. Um, but you're still here at relatively high variability. So uh, at 61,000 at this mark, 63,000 at this mark, 64,000, that's a lot higher variability than the provisioned IOPS offering. And we're, um, we know that there are some workloads that need the very, very fastest thing you can possibly build. But we have a lot of customers that, that have experience with SSD and have opted into high 1.4 XLs uh, far, far earlier than their actual workload need really requires or, or, or demands. So um, we're eager to have folks um, take provisioned IOPS for a whirl in this context and, uh, and, and see the sort of benefits there. And another piece um, really critical from a stability standpoint, the configuration of disk is entirely, uh, entirely impactful in the way that it works. You really do have to raise the file descriptor limits. We really recommend using a file system you can freeze like ext4 or XFS. Um, absolutely critical to have no DRA time, no A time on those volumes uh, in a mounting configuration. Um, uh, please don't use large virtual memory pages. Uh, set the disk read ahead at a reasonable rate, you know, snapshot like a wild person. Those are all great things that can make your application a little more stable uh, a little more high performance uh, and have a big impact in how it works. So we also want to make sure uh, that you see this uh, from what we've seen, particularly with some of our 
uh, large MongoDB customers that this is absolutely a scalable infrastructure and, uh, and, and, and it's important that you're, one, able to get big, really big, really fast because we have a lot of workloads that run on us where change is important and it's also really important to be able to shrink right back down. So um, the amount, uh, the interesting thing or the convenient thing is that in AWS, the compute resources and the disk resources are abstracted and independent. So it's entirely possible to have an ultra big computer with a whole bunch of memory at one time and then a much smaller computer with much less memory at another time. So uh, we worked with RangeSpan. They built you know, a pretty significant MongoDB deployment, three, uh, three instances doing the sort of normal replication piece. Uh, the important interesting bit there being that they absolutely expected 1,000% growth over the course of the next month. So they're at three instances to start with. You know, it's replicated, they're doing what they're supposed to do, but they expect it to be 10 times bigger than this in a very short period of time. So uh, it's critical from our perspective for successful scaling with uh, Mongo that you have enough capacity from a performance standpoint in the database to survive the resharding and redistribution of that data uh, and, and to shard effectively, make sure that you've got this sort of data spread out to get to that 10x or 100x or 1000x multiple uh, of performance. But it's also important to note that at scale, as you get to many, 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 many nodes to hit the sort of target that you're looking for, this does become kind of an operational challenge. Uh, we have a lot of customers that have opted early to scale super, super wide, hundreds of large instances, because they started on three large instances, and it just made sense to add more and more of those. Uh, it, it makes sense from our perspective, instead of dealing with that sort of operational overhead, that you can scale both ways. It's okay to go to bigger instances with more memory to increase the density of your deployment, decrease the total sharding breadth, and get to a place where you're using more memory per box and larger boxes to scale both ways. Not only taking advantage of sharding, but also taking advantage of the variety of instance sizes that exist. And that same pattern then allows you to take the storage component and scale it, if that makes sense, if your data set is much, much larger than your query load, you can scale up the amount of disk that you use as a ratio of the machines. If your query set is, uh, or if your data set's much, much smaller, but your performance, uh, your, the amount of queries that you're running is much, much higher, you can have many more machines as a ratio of disk. Uh, and if you need the absolute sort of biggest stuff, um, just those nine machines um, you know, running our high one 4XL instances, that's a half million IOPS uh, to disk, not just to memory to disk. On, uh, on AWS. So another pattern for that uh, is it's uh, fairly straightforward to, uh, to move down to smaller instances. You know, say for example, if you have uh, you know, a workload that's very seasonal or uh, is event oriented or uh, otherwise scales, it can be complicated and time consuming to reshard, to redistribute the data set that you have, but it's relatively straightforward to take a functioning replica set and stop some of those machines and bring them back as smaller versions of themselves, reestablish replication, and walk down the line of machines so that for that nine node unit, you're looking at 90% less spend just by doing a little bit of operational work to watch that thing go through a shutdown cycle. That's a giant shift uh, in the amount of dollars spent because for most of these deployments, EC2 hours are far and away the largest uh, source of cost. So that's the sort of general content uh, and best practices that are a part of the white paper. Uh, there's a lot more information that, uh, that TenGen offers as well. Uh, and there are a lot of customers that have taken a lot of advantage of this. So we have, um, uh, I think, a great customer from uh, Parse. Uh, um, uh, uh, Charity Majors is here to talk a little bit about uh, how they've used the product and, and what it's been like to run it on AWS.